Okay, look, let's make a start. Welcome everyone to this Making Public Histories webinar um, about public monuments and contested histories. I'm Alistair Thompson from History at Monash University in Melbourne, and I'll be chairing our webinar this evening. We've got online participants from across locked down Melbourne, but also from regional Victoria and pretty well every other state in Australia, but also from overseas in the United Kingdom. So welcome to you all, and I'm sure we'll have people joining us over the next few minutes as well. All of us who are in Australia are on Aboriginal or, or Torres Strait Islander land. I'm speaking from the Wurundjeri land in Melbourne. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands on which we meet today, and to name that I'm living and working on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future, and to acknowledge that these elders have held and passed on the histories of their communities for thousands of years. These Making Public History seminars have been running in Melbourne since 20, two, sorry, 2008. And today is the first time we've done it by webinar and we've got the best part of 300 people signed up, which is more than we usually have in the old treasury building. The seminars are jointly hosted by the History Council of Victoria, by the History Program at Monash University and by Old Treasury Building. And we're looking forward to being able to go back to the Old Treasury Building when lockdown finishes. The aims of the Making Public History seminars is to explore ways in which histories are represented, understood and contested in contemporary society, in different sites and in many different contexts. Uh, and this evening's webinar about public monuments and contested histories seems a very appropriate uh, topic for one of the Making Public History seminars. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to just briefly explain the webinar format and some protocols for attendees. So a webinar, a Zoom webinar is a bit different from a normal Zoom meeting, some of you will be familiar, but basically only the presenters and the hosts can be seen and heard. So all of you attendees out there, you can't be seen and you can't be heard, but you can use uh, a number of buttons at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the Q&A button is the place where you want to ask questions to any of the presenters. You just need to type them in and click return and we'll be moderating those. And the chat button, we'd like you, if you have any technical issues with Zoom, uh, to type those into the chat button and my colleague Margaret Burtley from the History Council will be checking those and if possible helping you out. If one of our presenters internet connection gets slow or disrupted or indeed if mine does then we'll turn off our video and continue with voice only but we've been practicing and it all seems to be okay. I need to let you know that we're recording this webinar tonight. All the presenters have given permission for the recording to be made and then hosted on the History Council of Victoria website. So you just need to know if you're asking a question in the Q&A and you'd like to remain anonymous, you can click anonymous uh, so that your name will not come up with the question. Otherwise, um, when the question is read out, we'll probably read out who the question is from, uh, so it won't be anonymous. And of course, please do keep your questions polite and respectful. Uh, what we're going to do in terms of the structure of this evening is that each presenter is going to speak in turn for around 10 minutes each. And then after each presenter finishes, we'll have five minutes of Q&A directed just at that presenter. And that's going to be moderated by my History Council uh, colleague, Alicia Ciretto. Uh, and then at the end of the three presentations and those short Q&As, we'll have a panel Q&A uh, where you'll be able to see all the panellists and the co-hosts and you'll be able to ask questions to the whole panel. And again, we'll be moderating uh, those questions. My colleague from Monash, Susie Krochke, is gonna be moderating that Q&A to try and draw upon as many of your questions as possible and ask them to our presenters. I think that's pretty well all I have to do by way of introduction. So let me now just introduce our presenters and their topics. Uh, Peter McPhee is an Emeritus Professor at the University of Melbourne and Chair of the History Council of Victoria. And Peter's going to be talking about revolutions and patrimonial panics in France. Claire Baxter holds a Masters of Conflict Archaeology and Heritage from the University of Glasgow. And she's going to be talking about contextualizing relocated monuments, lessons from three post-Soviet statue parts. And John Patton is a 
bunge along Yorta Yorta man on his father's side and a descendant of First Fleet convicts, Irish rebels, and the Sami people of Lapland by his mother. John's manager of diversity and belonging at Museums Victoria and as a board member of the History Council of Victoria. I'm sorry, I should have gone back and that slide up. And we have apologies from Eve Rees from La Trobe. Lee, Eve is unwell and so is unable to join us. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and gonna ask the presenters and co-hosts apart from Peter, if you can mute your videos and audio and introduce Peter to make it start. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Al. And I also want to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the lands of the Wurundjeri people. Societies have always used statues and other signs as ways of recognising power and eminence. Civic symbols matter. As appropriations of public space to make claims about the meaning of the past, they're often a focus of contestation, as in contemporary Australia. There's public debate right now over whether and which statues should be removed, who should make the decision, and what should be the fate of the statues themselves. Should they be displayed with explanatory plaques, preserved in museums, or simply removed? In times of revolutionary change especially, the legitimacy of statues can become the focus of collective iconoclastic action. In revolutionary New York, for example, the statue of uh, King George III, only erected in 1770, was pulled down after the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Revolutionary iconoclasm was far more explosive in revolutionary France after 1789. Revolutionaries set about transforming every dimension of public life. So in this presentation, I want to survey not only the range of objects destroyed, from buildings and statues to books and paintings, but also the range of responses of revolutionary governments. The French Revolution has always had the reputation of extreme destruction of physical remains of the old regime. Indeed, the very word vandalism dates from 1793, and it has a good deal to tell us today. 231 years ago today, on the 14th of July, 1789, Parisian working people seized the massive Bastille fortress that dominated the popular neighbourhoods of Paris. So decisive was this upheaval that the new National Assembly decided to let out a contract for its demolition. But the Assembly was also aware of angry popular destruction of physical remains of what was now called the old regime. Not only things like tax offices, but also masses of written records and it decided in September 1790 to create the uh, Archive Nationale, the National Archives, to preserve written records as the nation's heritage. After the declaration of war in 1792, the landed property of emigres who had fled to the enemy was to be sold off. But what should happen to more personal possessions, such as their libraries? Some 300,000 books and manuscripts had been seized from emigres. Much else was simply destroyed. Now the Royal Library, dating back to the reign of Louis XI in the 15th century, was to be their repository. And in September 1792, it became the public library, the Bibliothèque Nationale. Statues were particularly problematic, especially following the overthrow of the monarchy on the 10th of August 1792 and the proclamation of a republic. The next day, the 11th, the statues of Louis XIII, XIV and XV uh, were torn down. Henry IV's statue, erected in 1614 after his assassination in 1610, was torn, was torn down on the morrow. On the first anniversary uh, of the overthrow of the monarchy on the 10th of August, 1793, the Republic was celebrated in uh, a great ceremony organized by the artist and revolutionary Jacques-Louis David. Elected deputies filed past the Fountain of Regeneration, a temporary model of the Egyptian allegory of nature, Isis, from whose breasts spouted regenerative water to slake the rep representatives 
thirst for virtue. But the Republic's grandeur was also marked symbolically that very same day by the foundation of the Public Museum of the Louvre. And this was to be a turning point in the history of museology. The Louvre had for a century housed the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, a maze of ateliers and workshops. In 1791, the assembly had decreed that it should become instead a museum for the nation's masterpieces. And it opened on the 10th of August, 1793, with more than 500 paintings, mostly from royal collections of property or property confiscated from the church. At the heart of the divisions between the most militant of the Parisian revolutionaries, known as the sans-culottes, and the dominant Jacobins in the government, was the extent to which the creation of a secular Republican culture should purge France of physical traces of the old regime. There was often a tension between popular symbolic physical destruction of religious statuary, paintings, and other signs of the pre-revolutionary past, and on the other hand, Jacobin concern for what the revolutionary bishop, the Abbe Grégoire, called vandalism. In some regions of the country, churches were stripped of alleged idolatry and turned into temples of reason. And there was a large scale destruction of statuary still visible around the entry to many provincial churches in France today. For the first time in history, common soldiers who fell in battle were honored alongside generals and the Republic itself. The scale and solidity of the memorials varied, varied markedly from a stone obelisk in the eastern town of Thionville on the, eastern, uh, on the eastern border to a simple tree in the Pyrenean village of Villa de Belle. So the response of revolutionary governments to this astonishing range of attacks on physical reminders of the old regime had been to create three institutional pillars of heritage, the National Library, the National Archives, and the National Museum. One lesson from this history, however, is that this is contested history. The statue of Henry IV was reconstructed in 1818 from a statue of Napoleon and is still there today in the heart of Paris. And we need to remember that iconoclastic attacks on statues and other symbols can come from any direction. Even the statue of Voltaire, the philosopher who famously insisted that, quote, discord is the great ill of mankind and tolerance is the only remedy for it. Even the statue of Voltaire in the Latin Quarter of Paris has been obscenely attacked, probably by ultra right wing activists. The French anthropologist Daniel Favre has produced a collection of essays titled Emotion Patrimoniale literally patrimonial emotions, although the term émotion in, in French when applied to collective attitudes rather denotes panics. Fabre argues that we're still living through a sea change across the past half century, from the time of monuments to the time of patrimony. That is, he argues, there's been in many parts of the world a shift from commemorating powerful men through statues to recognizing patrimony in the sense of widely shared cultural markers, such as places and events. In Australia too, the creation of heritage councils and registers is a measure of this new age of patrimony. We've seen a limited democratization of memorials, for example, on the Great Ocean Road, where the returned soldiers who dug it out from coastal cliffs were remembered close to the famous memorial arch in 2007. The nearby arch, by the way, is at least the fourth since 1936, although the earlier ones were destroyed by bushfires rather than by iconoclasm. There are many other ways to recognize patrimony. One of the explosive and violent battles of the era of the French Revolution was over slavery. The Atlantic ports of Bordeaux, La Rochelle, and here Nantes had boomed across the 18th century because of their trade in colonial produce produced by the slavery-based plantations of the French Caribbean. Slavery was abolished in 1794. A most powerful recognition and interrogation of the past through remembering a space 
is this slavery trail in Nantes, which takes people past the houses of 18th century slave traders and merchants to the dockside. There, a harrowing display of objects from the slave trade is exhibited under the wooden wharves, whose groaning timbers evoke the reconstructed slave ship alongside. In conclusion, I want to suggest that, uh, therefore, our current debates and social movements need to be understood within this context of recognition of patrimony. The recent uh, Black Lives Matter protests have revivified debates about the appropriateness of statues of specific individuals. But anger has also been generated within the broader context of recognition of patrimony by the coincidence of protests with the recent destruction of the Jukin Caves in the Pilbara by a mining company. So the other side of the coin from the current debates about the survivals from the time of monuments is how well we are safeguarding irreplaceable heritage in this new time of patrimony. At the time of the French Revolution, the debate was very much about which statues and other physical remains of a hated past should be destroyed or protected. Today, it should also be about what should be remembered in the sense of natural patrimony and how we should do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and just to remind people who joined after the introductory comments, we're going to have five minutes of Q&A after each of the three presentations. So if you've got questions to ask of Peter, you should be typing them into the Q&A section, not into the chat section, which is for technical concerns. My colleague, Alicia Ciretto from the History Council of Victoria is gonna come on screen now, and Alicia is gonna moderate the Q&A to Peter over the next five minutes. So over to you, Alicia, and you might just like to explain how you want this to work. Thank, thank you, Al, and thanks, Peter, for your talk. And um, yes, really, for anyone who hasn't been part of a, a webinar Q&A, right down the very bottom of your screen, um, you can see a few different icons and in particular, the one we need here is the one called Q&A. And if you just ask the questions there, I'll be able to pass them on, on to Peter. Um, and of course, there, uh, Peter, I should pass on that there are a few different thank yous from um, members of the audience in the chat saying um, thank you. But the very first question comes from Robin. And Robin says, what do you say to the fact that perhaps many people may not understand the historical context of the setting up of the statues at the time? And should those people take that into consideration? Oh, thank, thanks for a very good question. Um, and I think that it's, it's very important that we bear in mind when people are discussing the appropriateness, appropriateness of a particular statue we're talking about objects which themselves have histories. Uh, and one of the contentious things about um, the destruction of, of statues in the United States recently had to do with the, the time at which some of those statues were actually erected. So that, for example, some of the statues of Confederate generals, which were, which were pulled, pulled down, in fact, had been uh, erected surprisingly recently and was seen at the time to have a very distinctive uh, political edge. Mm. My own view, of course, is that um, as much as possible, as much as possible, uh, I would like to see um, statues used as ways of increasing historical literacy. Uh, and if it's decided that it's appropriate, for example, for statues to uh, in future be accompanied by explanatory plaques, either where the statue is situated or if the statue is removed to a museum, I think it's very important that part of that explanation has to do with when the statue was erected and by whom, what's the point of it? We need as much as possible, I think, to understand statues as history themselves. Mm. So context is key, it is what part of what That's you're right. saying. That's right, and um, the, the, the statues that we uh, are talking about are not statues that have been there uh, since time immemorial. They were erected by particular groups of people or governments for a particular purpose. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sort of following on a little bit from Robin's question um, is one from Julia and she says, do you think the destruction of statues such as Voltaire are more about the destruction for destruction's sake? And is there a reason why Voltaire would have been targeted in this case? Oh, that's a that's a very tricky question because uh, the the statue of Voltaire simply it does have have his name on it. I mean, as, apart from a, a, some obscene uh, words and abbreviations, there's also his name that's tagged on the statue. So the people that did it knew what they were doing, and it was right in the heart of the Latin Quarter of Paris, where there is quite a deal of political political friction between different groups of students. My concern, to be quite frank. My concern about simply removing statues um, at will uh, is that it does uh, permit people such as those who attack Voltaire's statue to, to do what they want as well. Okay. Uh, I don't know how many people who are listening to this might realise that just uh, 10 days ago in the city of Rochester in the United States, the statue of, um, of Frederick Douglass who was a very, very important 19th century black activist, anti-slavery activist, uh, a statue of Frederick du uh, Douglass was destroyed, uh, which is really horrific. Um, but the people that did that obviously were, were motivated by a feeling that, well, if other people are attacking statues of Confederate generals, we've got the right to attack a statue of Frederick Douglass. Mm. So um, there, is that, there is that problem as well. Okay. And there's, a, there's that sort of going on that um, conversation of destruction. Um, John says, the French Revolution is often cited as the most destructive period of iconoclasm in history. Do empirical studies exist to justify this claim? And how does that compare to today's scale or perhaps the post-Soviet period? Uh, there's, um, I don't know whether quantitative studies have ever been done comparing different periods of history, but certainly the level of destruction during the French Revolution was extreme and for all sorts of reasons. I mean, um, one of the reasons was the, the demands of the war effort. So there was a point at which so desperate was the revolutionary government for military material during, uh, during the great revolutionary wars that every, uh, every parish church in France, every one of the 60,000 churches had to give up uh, their church for the war, effort. Um, whereas there's some other destruction, which was simply an act of, of anger at what was seen as the old regime. But the critical point that I want to make is that while a, an extraordinary uh, amount of physical damage was done and the destruction of uh, libraries and paintings and all the rest of it, it's fascinating to me that at the very same time, within the space of a couple of years, those three great institutions in terms of national heritage, uh, the library, the archives and the National Museum are actually created and very deliberately by revolutionary leaders who are saying, we may hate the old regime and everything it stands for, but like it or not, it is part of the nation's heritage yes. and it must be safeguarded. But certainly there have been extensive studies done of just the, the range of, of uh, destruction of physical objects that takes place. And Peter, that's, um, and everyone, that's the last question that we've got time for for now. We're, we're um, still going to hold your questions in the Q&A and if there's time at the end, um, we'll be able to put that into general discussion. So back to you, Al. Alicia, and thanks very much, Peter. That was just fascinating historical background to our contemporary issues. I'm Al Thompson from Monash and chairing this session for any latecomers, just a reminder, use the Q&A to post questions to any of our presenters and we're having a five minute Q&A after each presentation and then a longer Q&A for the whole panel at the end. So I'm delighted now to welcome uh, Claire Baxter who holds a Master of Conflict Archaeology and Heritage from the University of Glasgow and Claire is going to be talking about contextualising relocated monuments, lessons from three post-Soviet statue parks. So Claire over to you, um, the other hosts are all um, mute our videos and audio and you can share your screen when you're ready. Great. Thanks, Al. Um, so firstly, we'd like to acknowledge that I am coming to you today from the land of the Boon people um, and pay my respects um, to the elders there. 
Um, and as um, Al mentioned, my um, I did my master's last year at the University of Glasgow and wrote my thesis about um, contextualizing relocated monuments and particularly looking at the three post-Soviet statue parks in Eastern Europe as case studies um, and looking at how in particular they had pre um, presented the context of their statues, which is, I guess, a nice segue from what Peter was just talking about um, in regards to the importance of context in this um, debate. So um, the first thing I did was look at what context actually meant um, and looked at a framework of four different types of context. So um, physical context, where the statue was actually physically located, um, biographical, so who is the statue of or what event is it depicting, um, the historical context in which the statue was erected, and then the social context in which the statue is being viewed now. Um, I then travelled to the three um, parks and had a quick look at how they presented their context um, against that framework. And so I'm going to give a quick overview of each of the parks and then talk about a couple of the key learnings that I took away from them. So the first park that I visited was um, Memento Park in Budapest. This one was opened in 1993 and it contains 42 Soviet statues that came from in and around Budapest. Added next to the statues beyond a simple park, which um, you can see up in the top corner. Um, you can purchase a guidebook or pay for a tour with a guide, um, but on the day that I visited, um, basically no one took up those options. Everyone just paid the standard entry and walked around on their own. And the park claims that it provides no interpretation on purpose because they want to leave that up to the viewer to interpret themselves. Um, but in reality, that is kind of difficult if you don't already have knowledge of the city um, and the era uh, um, concerned. The second park that I visited was um, Grutus Park in Lithuania. And this one was opened in 2001, um, and it's a bit further off the main tourist trail. So it's about two hours from Vilnius in the town of um, Druskin and Kai, which I've probably pronounced terribly, and sorry to any Lithuanian speakers listening. Um, the statues here come from all over Lithuania, um, unlike Memento Park, where they just came from Budapest. And the park entry here costs around eight euros. But then there's also an optional audio guide um, for like 13 euros. Um, and like at Budapest, I saw nobody else pay the extra for that one. Um, the statues here are located along two paths, about um, two miles of paths, and um, they're in like a woodland setting, um, like you can see here. And the interpretation provided is really mixed. So some have like a, a detailed um, biography. Some have a picture like these ones um, showing how the statue actually looked in its original location. Some just have a name and the town that it came from and then some have information on the audio guide as well. So it's a little bit inconsistent and all over the place. Um, mostly the information was very heavily biographical um, and it wasn't very neutral. So um, for example, the Biography of Karl Marx ends with the statement that his ideas led to activities which, quote unquote, terrified the world and ruined millions of lives. So they're not a, a neutral um, interpretation there. And then the last park that I went to was the Park of Arts in Moscow, Russia. Um, and unlike the other two, this one's free to enter. Um, it's located right in the center of the city, just across the road from Gorky Park, so one of the main um, tourist sites. And this park was created kind of by accident um, in 1996. Um, the statues were removed from their location and placed in a field behind the Central House of Artists and were kind of just abandoned there and then they started to become a tourist attraction on their own, um, which caused the Moscow city government to create a formal display from them. And they have since installed many other statues and art pieces in the park as well. Um, so there's around a thousand sculptures in the park in total. And I think the um, ones presenting, representing Soviet leaders and ideologies was more like around 30 um, from my count but it was actually really difficult to tell because in the mean, the only interpretation provided was a plaque, um, like 
the one in the picture next to Brezhnev. And um, it just has the name of the person um, who created the sculpture, the name of the person depicted, and the year and the, um, the substances made out of, so like marble. Um, so it was kind of representing them as pieces of art rather than Soviet propaganda. And if you don't know who the individuals are, you kind of don't know which ones are writers or artists or just like abstract art pieces. Um, and then about five of the statues, like this one, had um, expanded interpretation boards, which told the story of the statue's creation in a very, very brief way. Um, and also where it stood, so like this one um, was in front of the Bolshoi Theatre in Moscow. Um, but they don't actually tell us anything else about that, so it doesn't tell us who Stalin was, um, it doesn't tell us why it was created, why it came down, how his notice came to be missing, um, anything along those lines. Um, and all of these boards end with a really interesting statement. This work is historically and culturally significant, being the memorial construction of the Soviet era on the themes of politics and ideology. But it doesn't actually tell us anything else about that. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a weird um, statement. So a couple of the, the key things that I learned um, from these parks, which I would hope um, could be introduced if we were to look at doing something similar um, elsewhere. Um, so the first one is to, um, none of them really tackled that, um, that changed social context. So um, like why they were erected in the first place and how that's changed over time and you know, the lens that we're viewing them through now. So, um, there's kind of no education about that broader meaning of monuments and yeah, I guess there's a need there to make the exhibits about people, so about us and how we use the monuments, how we use the space around them, um, rather than the fact that it's marble and um, who it was created by. So. The only park that really tackled this um, was Memento Park in Budapest, and it was really only via the tour guide that that information came out. So on the day that I visited, um, the guide told us stories about um, the way in which the space around the statue was used. So like this one, for example, the Soviet heroic memorial. Um, it's a little bit hard to see from this angle, but um, the soldiers have triangular caps on, which you can kind of see on the guy on the right. And so the local people decided that they looked a little bit like Mohawks. And um, so the punk community in the, like the 1980s kind of adopted the memorials hangout spot and, and changed the meaning of it. So um, rather than destroying it, um, they sort of subtly changed the meaning of the monument. And then this guy, um, whose name I'm also going to butcher because my Hungarian isn't very good, is Endre Segvari. Um, and again, the, the guide told us a story about um, that there was a debate around whether to um, leave this one in place or whether to take it down because kind of similar to some of the discussions that we're having now. Um, he was a hero of the Nazi resistance during the war, so therefore kind of one of the good guys, um, but he was also a member of the Communist Party, so therefore one of the bad guys. And that's why in the end the decision was made to remove his statue because it was put up for the reason of communist propaganda rather than to honor his work in the resistance. So this was like really informa um, important information about why monuments are created and what they mean, but it was only related through the tour guide, which cost extra. Um, and that option was on the day of my visit was taken up by myself and two other people and nobody else. So everybody else missed out on that information. Um, the other, I guess, really important thing, especially in terms of physical context, is um, photographs. So this one from um, Grutus Park, you can see um, the picture on the left. It, the, the bust is located close to the ground, surrounded by tall trees. You're viewing it from a walkway, um, which is you know, maybe 10 metres away and it looks fairly small and insignificant, um, but in the photo on the right, on the interpretation board, it looks a lot more imposing. So a tall plant looking down on you um, looks a lot larger 
And so without those photos, you kind of don't get that sense of um, how menacing the statue might have been for people um, in that space. Um, and then like in addition as well, at Memento Park, there's 42 statues in a fairly small area. So it also gives the impression of a higher saturation of um, ideological statues than would have actually been the case. So a map, for example, of the city and where the statues were located would have been great. Um, and then like these days as well, there's other techniques, especially from an archeological point of view. Um, so photogrammetry, laser scanning, which be um, used to create representations of the statues as they stand now. Um, and then that, you know, that might get us around actually having to keep them and save cost on having to, you know, find somewhere to store them, conserve them, um, can actually present them digitally instead. The, um, one of the other things that really came out was there was a little bit of confusion about um, the purpose of the parks, which led to a kind of a little accusations of irony, I suppose. Um, so for example, um, picture on the left here, me sitting on Lennon's foot, picture on the right, which wasn't me, um, of a lipstick mark on Lennon's head in Moscow. So not having that context provided about why these are important, why they mattered to people, um, how they influence people's lives, um, means that there's kind of not really a tone for how to behave around them. So yeah, there's millions of photos like these online of people um, behaving in perhaps inappropriate ways. Um, for the souvenirs sold in the shops, they're a little bit of a joke as well. You know, some of the magnets get, you know, CDs and music and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, it's led to a criticism that, that the tone is one of irony rather than actual education. And Grutus Park as well has been described as a Soviet Disneyland and it contains um, a playground and a miniature zoo as well as the statues. Um, so yeah, then I think having proper context would work better at setting that tone across the whole park. And then you kind of need to have a clear aim what it's trying to achieve. Um, and any advertising and any souvenirs need to be consistent um, with that message as well. Uh, yeah, I guess. To, to finish up um, in recommending that we should be telling more human stories um, and giving information about the recent past, that can be difficult to do. Um, it requires a lot of skill from an interpreter in order to make sure that it isn't just another top-down message, that it's actually multivocal, involves extensive communi um, community consultation and yeah, it really brings in like a lot of different viewpoints rather than just one interpreter telling us what, what the meaning actually is. Um, so in general, none of the parks that I visited really hit the mark in terms of the framework that I assessed them against, um, but I still think that there are those important learnings in terms of the context that is missing. Um, and then the need to make this information accessible at the most basic level, so someone pays the the entry price, they get the information, they don't have to pay extra to access it. And then we also need to record the objects while they're in place, um, record their, their locations, um, take images of them, scan them, um, and rec also record the stories and activities associated with them now before we remove them. Um, so, and then that you know, will help us to use them to best educational advantage. Thank you, Claire. Um, what a different approach, you know, in terms of that idea of, of a sculpture park and how you've been able to analyse that as part of your, your research. Um, an invitation to everyone to um, put some more questions in the Q&A, but I can see as with Peter's um, talk that we've prompted very many questions. So, Claire, um, there's a question here saying, why were the Soviet statues placed in parks rather than in museums? Um, I think it's a matter of space, really. So, um, like, yeah, I know Budapest, they went through a very similar process to what we're talking about now. So they, um, a lot of debate about what they should do with them, should they be destroyed? Um, and so, yeah, the park was created, like, housing 42 large 
statues in a museum is going to be really difficult. Um, and the other problem with a museum as well is, like I mentioned, with presenting them outside, um, low to the ground, you kind of lose that sense of scale. In a museum, you can actually heighten that scale. So, you know, if you, you put a really large object in a relatively small room, it's going to look like it took up a lot more space than it actually did. So, yeah, I think um, the other thing, I guess, it's a little bit easier for um, these societies is that there's a clear theme. Um, so these are all Soviet leaders, you know, Communist Party members. It's not a mix of like a colonialist and a slave trader and you know, it's, it's a little bit more finite. Um, and for Hungary and Lithuania in particular, there's a real, I guess, sense that um, it's almost a little bit easier for them in a way because they, they view it as something that was imposed on them from outside. So it's, and, and they actually don't talk about collaborators and um, homegrown communism. It's, it's really a presentation of, um, yeah, this was something that was imposed on us from outside and we've been able to, to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, where, which is, I think, maybe where Moscow hasn't provided as much information. And the other thing to acknowledge with Moscow as well is that there's still plenty of Lenin statues in the street. So why some were removed and some weren't um, also yeah. isn't tackled. Yeah. yeah. Paul has got a great question about, well, how, how do people who use the parks, how do they live? So the park in Moscow is free. So do people use it as an open space like any other or do they engage with the statues? Um, I, yeah, both. Um, so that, yeah, there'll be um, people going for a walk, going for a run, kicking a ball around. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure the numbers of people um, engaging with the statues, I'm guessing, are probably largely tourists um, in that setting. Um, but yeah, there, there's certainly plenty of locals just using the park as a park. Just as a park. They're not, they're not stopping to read plaques if there were any or or reflect on it, yeah. Um, so someone's asked here too, um, you know, what about, um, given the fraught relations between Lithuania and Soviet Union, is there a case to be made for playful subversion at the park being a desired outcome, even if not by design? Um, I'm not sure I 100% understand the question. Um, yeah, sorry, go. That's okay. I was going to say, I suppose, you know, uh, are there other ways of, of presenting it or, you know, could you be provocative even um, in, if you were managing such a park? Yeah, and um, I guess Lithuania in particular maybe slightly is. Um, that's, yeah, it's definitely not neutral. Like it's, like I said, you know, Karl Marx. Um, another board that I remember, I can't remember who it was, um, talked about his blood curdling crimes. Um, so yeah, it, it's definitely um, not neutral and yeah, it could, like there would be that potential to, to make it a very anti-Russian um, construction if, if that's the way they wanted to go with it for sure. Yeah. We've got about one more minute of question time. So thanks everyone for your questions. But the very last one is about, you know, could we be using oral history as a way to um, interpret those meanings of the statues and, and challenge what we're seeing? Yeah, um, I definitely um, think that we should be. And one of the articles that I read um, was a woman um, called Janine Bryant in the States and she, um, made a, a comment that um, she uses statues in um, her town, which I think was North Carolina somewhere, as markers of areas, which, which areas were safe and which areas were not safe um, yeah, as a black woman in that society. And that is something that as a white tourist, I would just never even consider. So I think that kind of, um, yeah, oral history of, her experience moving around that same space that I am also moving around and just not having to think about is really important. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when plaque, you know, plaques are limited. There's more storytelling um, to be told than can be encompassed on a small metal um, yeah. plaque. Absolutely. Right. Thank you, Claire. Thanks everyone for your questions.
Thank you, Alicia, and thanks so much, Claire. It's been wonderful to have case studies from the French Revolution and now from Eastern and Central Europe to contextualise our contemporary issues and debates. And so let me now introduce our third speaker, John Patton. Uh, John is a Bunjalong Yorta Yorta man on his father's side and a descendant of First Fleet convicts, Irish rebels, and the Sami people of Lapland by his mother. He's manager of diversity and belonging at Museums of Victoria and a board member of History Council of Victoria. And John's gonna talk about First People's perspectives in contextualizing contested history. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Weiwurrung and Bunwurrung speaking peoples of the Kulin Nations. I'd also like to acknowledge their elders, both past and present, and everyone who's taken the time to join with us this evening. Now, one of the things that I'd like to address is how we look at statues and, and monuments as a, a basic structure. You know, what, what is their, their value? and how do we break it down contextually uh, from the, the different cultures that we belong to? So when I look at uh, statues and I, I think about how history is presented and our statues are a reflection of history, I, I think they, they go to only a, a very small extent when we record our history through books and journals and as was uh, related earlier through oral tradition. And for my culture, 65,000 years of oral tradition is incredibly important for how we perceive and, and tell our stories and share them with others. Um, but when I think about statues, the way I contextualize them is that they are a bookmark. They are a piece of string around someone's finger and they help us to Google uh, an element. So we, we use it as a starting point to explore a story, whereas they don't actually record the story itself. And when we look at uh, a monument, whether it is a stone structure in a park, or it might be an image on the side of a, an American football helmet, where we see the most recently uh, today, the, the announcement that the Washington Redskins will no longer go by that name. These are the, some of those struggles that a lot of people really find personally confronting. That First Peoples cultures, whether they're here in Australia, North America, or elsewhere in the world, uh, these are things that have a, a great deal of impact on us. And it's not an element from the past. These are intergenerational issues that flow down through the years that continue to impact us. So the, the types of terminology that we are bombarded with and how we are still building our communities on the, the back of the, the struggles that we've been faced with. So there, there's so much to consider that when we talk about history to today, and especially in the media, there is a, a complete loss of understanding for those First Peoples perspectives that uh, they're often uh, spoken of as being revisionist, when the fact is that uh, Anglo-Celtic Australian history or broader Western culture is based on revision and, uh, re rev sorry, revisionism. It, it's that we have so many different layers of history and culture to, to explore but we are typically most comfortable in talking about our own. And so the, the stories of minorities and especially those that tell our stories through oral tradition are quite often marginalized. And so when we talk about the, the European tradition, we, we fail to, to realize that if we are talking about slavery and the impacts of those people that are memorialized today, uh, we, we look at the, the traumas that they inflicted on, on others and we minimise them because we look at the, the positives that they have, uh, may have uh, dealt to the community through their lives. And so how do we balance that out? We don't often see a, a balance in that conversation that there is a real need to contextualise things to a degree where we understand that it's not just 
a, a narrow view to, to speak about that for someone who was a, a slave owner, they may have been a part of government or the establishment of a, a nation like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson. But if they were slave owners or they were raping the, the people that they had on their plantations, it's the perspectives of those people that those injustices were being placed upon that we also have to consider. But their stories aren't often part of, of the overall way that we approach history in the Western world. So partly sometimes when we, we look at that conversation, we, we place it in a frame of saying it's about um, uh, that, that there is, at least for First Peoples, uh, we, we look at white guilt and the idea that we can't uh, have a, a conversation that is genuine where we can say, oh, I, uh, I, I feel empathy for you. Because it's often framed, especially by the media, in a way that says, uh, if we look at uh, the, the story of the Anzacs, for example, we can say, lest we forget. But if we talk about the impacts that are negative on First Peoples, we can't say the same thing. It, it's not about taking personal responsibility for the horrors that have been inflicted on others. It's simply about having empathy and recognizing that those things happen and that the effects of those events are still flowing and trickling down to people that are alive today. When we think about the stolen generations and the impacts of, of those people, Many of them are still with us. And so how they have been impacted in being in uh, schools away from their family and not having that connection to their culture, this all plays out throughout uh, statues and through any form of memorialization, whether it is the, the football helmet or the red skin lollies or whether it is that perceived beautiful statue in a park. Um, slavery, murder, rape, these are things that no matter which way you look at it, they've always been recognized as wrong. Uh, whether a, a slave owner was able to perceive that themselves, they had contemporaries who were able to see it. That we might turn a blind eye to our own actions and in the future we will be potentially judged and it's important that we do consider that we can judge the past because it isn't just about that narrow per perception that if if you commit a crime whilst you might not recognize it there will be others around you and certainly going back to the the situation with the slaves they were impacted they knew it was wrong that they were being held captive. So the, the way we, we look at it, you know, there is so much disinterest in some quarters, and then there is intense interest, especially with First Peoples and the Black Lives Matters movement, that uh, we need to have a genuine conversation where we can come together and recognize that for someone to go into a museum and see a statue of someone who had massacred their community, it's going to be incredibly confronting. That when I think of uh, friends that are archivists and they, they might look at the, the idea that every aspect of history, including the, the establishment of a statue, those are things that need to be preserved for study and for speaking to the need for educating younger audiences about the, the, the trauma and crimes and atrocities of the past. But there are other ways that we can do it. Is it a good idea to destroy an object? Uh, you know, whilst we might not record history through statues, they are certainly a part of history as already has been said. And so, to, to place something like that on display in a public space, especially in the context of a museum, when quite equally you could do the, the same thing in a, a valid manner by showing a photograph of the object or film showing 
the object at its most important point when it's being toppled, at least in the perspectives of those people who have been so heavily impacted by the person who has been raised up on that pedestal, that we need to recognize the histories from the perspectives of those people that have been most heavily downtrodden because of the people who are being memorialized. What might be a hero to someone is the, the nightmare for another person. And so it is important that we contextualize and understand both that very few people are without faults, but a murderer is a murderer. Someone who is a rapist is a rapist. We cannot escape from that. And so, especially when we look at what a statue is, we know that we have primarily, the majority of them are around the people we celebrate, our so-called heroes. Many of them valid, validly so, but in other cases, they need to be understood to a greater degree and their faults explored. If you look at someone like Mahatma Gandhi, you know, he was a, a fantastic humanitarian who did so many things for his people on the subcontinent. But at the same time, there's great ev evidence to, to show that he was certainly not fond of Africans when he lived in South Africa and he saw himself as better. So how do we place that in, in a proper context? Do we continue to memorialize him and celebrate his achievements? Or do we use another method for having a more mature conversation to recognize he did some great things, but some not so great things were also a part of the story? I think we need to really consider that balance to a huge degree. We don't do a fantastic job of it in Australian history. And in, in Australian history in particular, we do have a very narrow band approach that our schools are terribly underdone with what we understand of our, our history, that it all begins with 1788, World War I, World War II, the gold rush, multiculturalism in the 1950s, maybe a bit on the, on the, the gold fields with the, the Chinese, and then whatever is the flavor of the month. That's our entire narrative along with convicts. But there is so much more, whether it is around first people's history or, or beyond. And so it is very difficult for people to look at a statue of Lieutenant Cook, because he was never a captain, and really to explore the fact that he was a person who took shots at Aboriginal people before he even placed a foot on Australian soil. And so for First Peoples of this continent, he will always be a monster. He is not someone that we can celebrate. So taking it to, to the next step, it's important that we do evaluate the many different perspectives. Thank you, John, for bringing that um, perspective and bringing us into the present with your presentation tonight and inviting everyone to add your questions to the Q&A. And really, you know, I think that that question about museums and I think sometimes that's the solution for people who, who want to say, well, this is history, so we'll keep it in a museum. But we've got a question from Sonia saying, well, is an inappropriate display in a museum just as bad as a statue in a park? I, I think certainly for, for me personally, uh, if I see that statue that is responsible for crimes committed against my people, mm. certainly it needs to be contextualised to a, a large degree where we understand the negative impacts. But it's very difficult to do that when you're only... Most people who visit a, a museum they, they look at a display for a very, very short amount of time. It, it is typically only academics and the families of academics who spend more time exploring a story to a significant degree to, to look at those complexities. So having something that its primary purpose 
is to celebrate that person placed on public display is something that I'm uncomfortable with when I know that the, there are atrocities attached to it. Mm. So. Yeah, and I think your, com your point about, you know, using video, using, you know, photography um, to e explain perhaps the, you know, the life cycle of that statue and, and how we've got, got to it here is more valuable perhaps than just sort of plonking it in the middle of a, of a space and perhaps taking up a more broad and diverse storytelling opportunity that you might have. Yeah, certainly. I think the, the way that we can explore the, those objects through various forms of media and to, you know, a lot of people are very visually in their approach to things and a, a statue or a other sort of monument is a, a singular snapshot looking at a, a slice of time and from one person's perspective or a, a group of people's perspectives that don't speak for everyone um, and certainly it is always from the the dominant uh, culture so when we look at the the dearth of, of how many statues are around uh, australia that celebrate uh the, the civil rights struggle you know we we have doug nichols and uh william cooper um. but there are many others who have contributed to that story and they're they're not being celebrated um. And I think that that's that question here from from a couple of people where they've talked about, you know, perhaps this, you know, this this is a, an opportunity for understanding diversity in our public monuments. Certainly in Melbourne, we're looking at, you know, the majority of them are male. Of course, we're not sort of moving on from colonial times. So someone John's here's asked, can public monuments ever transcend those sort of tensions between? evolving social context and power dynamics what can we it's not there? necessarily the the role of the the monument to do that it's mm. our education system that sets up the 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 ability for the the public to be able to judge and understand and contextualize things for themselves that like, like i said we are so terribly underdone in our school system and yeah. as a flow on the the media that tells the stories of who we are they, they go in completely unarmed. And so we, we need people in a position to be able to remedy that to a huge degree. There is so much significant work to be done in the education system for people to be able to clearly express thoughts that enable us to, to understand what Australian society is more broadly. Yes. Uh, you know, absolutely, sort of tying in that education, you know, can, can the statues even be educational? Um, and, you know, your, your um, you know, returning point around education being the key here. Um, but there is someone who said, you know, will we make statues in the future? So are they sort of a bit of a, a relic? Um, what, what, might they look, what might that look like, um, public monuments in, in the future? It's a very good point. I mean, it, it, it does come down to us having created a, a large number of uh, objects in the public that weren't, there wasn't a lot of thought that went into their production, that it was, we are going to celebrate this person and we're not going to contextualise it in any way. Sometimes you might have a small plaque, but it says very little. Um, and it's the, the same way that I expect it to continue for quite some time, that there are other ways that we can look at history. I mean, again, those objects themselves, they have become to a degree a part of history, but they are not how we record it. Mm. Books are what we record our history in. Oral tradition and interacting with one another are how we record our history. And the statues are just a an extension, a very small extension of that. Yeah, yeah, just an output of, of that history. Thank you, John, for answering those questions and to everyone for your questions. And now back to Al. Thank you so much, John. That was fascinating and really important. And thank you, Alicia, for moderating that Q&A. As I explained right at the start, I'm Al Thompson from Monash History, and we've got time for a final 20-minute Q&A to the whole panel.
which is going to be moderated by my Monash colleague, Susie Prochke. Can I invite John and Claire and Peter to all unmute their video and their audio and hand it over to Susie and we'll carry on until about 25 past six. Over to you, Susie. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, some great um, presentations. I think because um, John was the last speaker, we've kind of got a few overflow questions for that are kind of directed to John, but that maybe we could all kind of um, participate in, or we could start with John and throw it open to the panel while our audience is kind of thinking of general questions that you might like to address. Um, I think one of the ones that I'm very interested in is um, from Anne, hang on, where is it? Um, so somebody has asked, I often think that people who say statues should all be shifted to a museum don't appreciate what museums are and do these days. So this is a really big issue. Susie, your audio is just gone. Can I suggest you might need to pause these people and also historians who are colonising museums? Okay, can you hear me now? Does that make is that better? Yes, yes. Susie. Yeah. Okay, all right, that's all right. We don't need to. We can. So the, I don't know how much of that you caught. I'll just start again. Um, so somebody has asked a really great question. I often think that people who say statues should all be shifted to a museum don't appreciate what museums are and do these days. And that goes to, I think, a big question that people in the museum sector and, um, and you know, who are in archives and historians who work with material culture and any kind of archives, we all kind of ask the question, well, who created these records? And there's been a big push to internationally to particularly decolonize museums, to kind of think very critically about um, the, the content that we have there and the stories that are already represented. So I guess we could start by putting that question to, to John, but it's a, it's a question that all historians have to deal with Mm. Really, so we could um, open that out to the panel. Yeah, absolutely. Museums are changing at a dramatic rate. Uh, so working at Museums Victoria and previously having been the manager of Bunjalaka Aboriginal Cultural Centre at MV, um, I've seen huge changes in the time that I've been there and it's only been around 10 years. Uh, when I first arrived, some of the stories were told expressly about my culture uh, from non-Indigenous expertise, which was valid, but certainly it left us out of the conversation. Uh, that has changed to a huge degree now where we are telling our own stories. So it's the, the same as if I was to travel to, to Ireland, I would want someone from that culture and living, it, breathing a part of that story to share that story with me. I wouldn't want an Australian backpacker for certain telling me the story. I, I want uh, things to be contextualised in a way that gives authenticity. But we have to be aware that with that change in a museum environment, we we have to recognise the, the the subtleties that are involved and the complexities around First Peoples wanting to tell our own story without... Uh, the celebration uh, of having a white explorer placed in an Aboriginal cultural centre, or uh, as we had 10 years ago, the story of William Buckley, uh, a white man who absconded from Sorrento in 1803 and spent the next 30 years living with the Wathurrung. A, a story like that where he was celebrated when he returned to uh, non-Indigenous society more or less, he was the, the, the Tarzan figure who had triumphed over the, the natives and despite having been held by the hand like an infant and taught how to live from the land. And so how do we tell those stories that whilst this is a, a story that has value in Australian history, is it necessarily the first thing you want to lead out with in an Aboriginal cultural centre? Absolutely not. Um, so how we place statues into collections if if they're not to be destroyed 
uh, and we recognize that the value of maintaining those in some way, it's not necessarily that they need to be on public display, but if academics want to access them for their own private research and for the, the broader good, well, that, that may be a fantastic result. Um, we have to protect people and their cultures to the degree that we recognize that they, they are valid and we don't validate and understand or appreciate other people too well uh, across the board. And do the other um, presenters have any uh, comments on, on that question of, you know, um, I guess the role that, that museums, um, you know, if we get rid of statues and we just put the, put them in, a, take them out of public spaces and put them in a museum, <laughs> what does that make museums or what has that made museums? Oh, I, I think that, um, I think museums have actually got a responsibility to, to uh, of an educative kind. I'm, um, uh, I'm actually extremely reluctant to simply uh, take uh, objects and remove them altogether from public view. Uh, that has to be done in some situations, I, I recognise, but it's extremely serious. I quite like the, um, the way that Eastern European countries have handled statues of Stalin and made them, uh, just put them in parks for people to make what they wanted them. But, um, you know, I, the, the reason why I wanted to, to uh, mention the work of that guy, uh, Daniel Farb, and that slave museum in, in Nantes, is to take the point that John was making so well about the way in which, in a way, we need to go beyond an obsession with statues, significant as they are, and to recognise other ways of acknowledging the importance of space and place. Uh, we have to be much more imaginative the way that we recognise patrimony and heritage, particularly in this country, Indigenous heritage. And we've got wonderful opportunities to do that in a very imaginative way in a way to sort of go beyond the, the battle over who gets to have a statue and to think, well, what is a really exciting, educative way of recognising the depth of history on this continent? And that's why, I mean, I was so struck when I went to Nantes and saw the way that they'd come to terms with slavery uh, by really saying, Here, here's a whole part of the city where we're going to, um, we're going to tell a story not just by putting up one statue, but by telling a story of a whole economy that was built on this. So what about, um, I'll just try and put my video on for a second, and if it doesn't work, then get rid of me again. So we've had a number of people in the audience, and I'm sorry I'm not naming you all because there are a lot of questions and I'm beginning to pull them together a bit. We've had a number of people um, suggesting that, you know, perhaps the way forward is to kind of make alternative uses of statues or in fact, as you've just alluded to Peter, do things to them. <laughs> so, you know, questions about, could we have allow for digital interactions um, somehow? I guess we're kind of doing our um, talk right now in a digital format. So is kind of, is, is, is sort of a, a digital solution in public spaces or in museums the way forward? Do we use uh, statues in installations to tell alternative stories? Um, is is that a way forward? Should we should we should we be encouraged to do things to statues? I think there's a lot of value in uh, what Peter said and and what what you can do in exploring uh, the, the past and statues through uh, an artistic lens. Uh, using multimedia and as I alluded to to some degree that whilst I, I might not be or my community necessarily be comfortable with a, a statue being placed on public display it doesn't mean that that story needs to be lost altogether that having a photograph of the statue and having it placed in the collection or a film talking to the, the story of the statue helps to a greater degree pull that into a way that uh, especially younger audiences can interact with it and, and understand it. Um, I, I think art can play a, a huge role, especially as we saw in the European example through um, looking at, at statues from a, a different perspective altogether. <laughs> 
play it, please. I guess um, just a couple of examples, um, things that I've seen recently, sort of going back to museums as well. So one, um, uh, one example is um, at the University of Texas in the Austin campus, there's a statue of just Jefferson Davis, which is actually being moved um, into their museum. So just a single statue, but it comes with a multimedia display, including um, the letters that were written back and forth between council members at the time, um, sort of explaining who funded it, why they wanted it, um, who made the decision to put it up in the first place. And then also like um, yeah, digital images of it coming down as well. So sort of, it's really a story of um, the statue's creation and why it was created and why it came down rather than who was Jefferson Davis and what did he do. Um, so I think that that's a really sort of interesting example. And then the other one I've seen recently is a um, photogrammetry scan of, um, I think it's the Robert E. Lee statue on Monument Avenue in Richmond in Virginia. And it's like a, a full 3D scan of the monument with all of the graffiti that's currently on it. And so I think having that and then having it as it originally looked, um, you can kind of have the best, you know, you can preserve both the original statue in a digital format and then have how it changed through time and how people kind of um, vandalised it, I suppose, um, and what that meant and kind of tell that story without actually having to keep the object itself. Um, saving space, saving money. Um, yeah, I think it's worth uh, sort of noting that in some parts of, you know, Western culture with a capital W, it's encouraged to keep examples of iconoclasm. So, you know, you go through parts of Europe where the Reformation happened and destroyed Catholic churches have been preserved. So I think, you know, and that then becomes part of the story. So it's, you know, the kinds of things we're discussing uh, are not... Um, unprecedented I think it's just we're being asked to we're looking at those questions from from other people's perspectives now I've got um, a couple of questions here from Helen and Sophie who've hit on a good one independently if we don't keep all statues what criteria should we use to decide what statues we do keep <laughs> well that's the that's the the really difficult question isn't it um, and and who gets to decide that? And I, uh, you know, I take John's point about um, the the role of first peoples in in being part of the a critical part of the decision making process. But um, you know, my my view is that um, my view is that there is this very difficult grey political area in the middle about how we make those sorts of decisions. Personally, I have I can't sympathise with a point of view which simply says that people who are angry about a statue should simply destroy it because that's what happens with the Voltaire statue. That's what happened um, the other, last week in, in Rochester where that, uh, you know, the, the statue of the, the black activist from the 19th century, uh, Frederick Douglass was, was destroyed. Um, but nor do I have a point of view which says that every statue is somehow sacred. I mean, there has to be a process by which statues which are deeply offensive to groups of people in the community there has to be a process by which their 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 place in public in public locations can be questioned but we then have a we then have the issue therefore of how we go about making those decisions and the frustrating thing for me in the in the recent debates in australia is that we haven't really focused on that particular issue susie and i worry that this very important question that that John has raised and that many other people have raised will simply sort of be pushed away because there's no vehicle by which it can actually be put on the agenda. There have been one or two municipal councils who've said, yes, we're going to have a hard look at the, at the statues in our municipality. But I think it's a very serious question and more people should be involved in working it through. There has to be some way of making these decisions. I think, yeah, as well, I think part of it comes down to that context as well. So, um, 
Captain Cook or Lieutenant Cook, as John referred to him earlier, um, at, at Botany Bay is maybe appropriate. It's in context. He landed there. That's where it all kicked off. Um, perhaps we add a memorial to the victims of colonialism as well that's next to that or opposite that from that. But to me, that is somewhat in context, whereas a memorial to Captain Cook in Edinburgh Gardens in Fitzroy why is that even there? He never even came to Melbourne. Like that's completely out of context. So um, for me, like that, that could be one way to make, not make that decision, but to start thinking about um, how to make that decision as well. It, it's funny you should say that, Claire. One of our questioners, and I've lost them now, but I remember asked, sometimes you've got a whole space, a whole public space, which dates from it particular era, let's say the Victorian era. And if you remove one of the statues there, then it kind of alters that whole kind of public space. Now, the, the fake, the, the weird Cook statue in the Fitzroy Gardens is, is not that, but the, that, the idea of those gardens that we particularly have in, in Melbourne dates from a particular period. And so this, you know, statues are in context. Um, how do we, what, what, I guess the question that, that this, um, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Oh, it's an anonymous person. Um, no, it's not. Never mind. Uh, I think you get the gist of my question. You know, what happens to the whole, the whole uh, space if we start selectively removing some parts of the whole story, you know, that the whole urban um, sort of history of that place. Yeah, and again, I think that it sort of has to be a little bit case by case. I don't think there's ever going to be one solution for every single statue. Um, and part of it, I think, comes down to, again, what John has said is um, like community consultation, just, you know, how offensive is that statue? to people and yeah like I, I guess it, it depends on um, on that how the community feels about it and just how much it would change that space entirely if you remove that one statue but kept the garden itself for example. John what do you think yeah, about that? It's absolutely a, a complex thing that uh, well, again, you know, one, one person's hero is, is an, another person's horror. And when when you look at it in that way, you, you can't countenance that uh, the, the, the feng shui of a, an environment might be a little bit upset. Um, that mm -hmm. it is about real world uh, people's feelings and an understanding of our collective histories. And so, yeah, there, there, there might be a... a a change to an environment that invites new conversations to to see what we can fill that void with. Um, have we got time for some more, Al? Yes, there's one more uh, time for at least one. Yeah, one more question. Go. Okay. Here's an interesting one, which kind of um, I guess brings a couple together. We tend to memorialise people in statues. Um, is the idea of pulling down statues, do we have a problem with that because they're people and there's emotion um, kind of connected to an effigy? Well, the, the emotion is attached to the way we've venerated people that these are, we, we are told they are heroes. But as we mature and, and grow and, and learn more about their stories, we understand that it's not so black and white. There is complexity to every story. No person is without you know, skeletons in their, their closet. That whether we're looking at the, the, the founders of the United States or Australia or Mother Teresa or anyone else, there are people with complex lives and we have to balance that out. And as Peter said, who makes that decision? It's a, a complex thing that we, we can't determine this evening, but 
certainly we, we need to have conversations and have mature conversations that allow us to, to look at whose story is of greater value to the, the public than the next. I'd love to see a situation, John, where, for example, the, the new uh, body that's been established in Victoria to represent the Indigenous voice to, to Victorian Parliament, that it might have some role in, in, uh, in setting forth uh, its views, the views of Indigenous peoples in, in Victoria uh, in this regard. But I think we need to have lots more conversations about, um, in every contextual situation, is the answer to, uh, in a particular situation, to have a plaque, to remove a statue, to put up a different statue of someone else, uh, or to think of uh, very different ways of, of, of remembering the uses that were made of particular spaces by particular people. Uh, I think that um, it's so interesting to think of, um, of uh, nowadays the history of patrimony in a much broader way than simply deciding who is the individual that gets to have their statue put up. I'm hoping that we've sort of moved on from that in many ways. I also don't necessarily think it's an attachment to the individual figures as much as it is maybe an attachment to a particular version of history. Yes. Um, and again, as John has referenced, like that comes back to the way it's taught in school. Um, you know, we are taught, or I was certainly taught um, at school in the late 80s, early 90s, that Captain Cook discovered Australia. And so that is a version of history that I think people are attached to. It's a, a version of like nation forming that um, people have grown up with and they think that that's what's important. And so by broadening our version of history um, from that school level, I think is is really important. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think that people are particularly attached to um, Captain Cook himself, but that's just the version of history that they know it's what's comfortable. Um, and it, it's their, part of their identity, really part of Australia's identity at this stage, whether right or wrong. Absolutely. Okay, look, we're just about up for time. Thanks very much, Susie, for moderating that Q&A. Just a few closing remarks now. And if you'll just allow me to share my screen uh, and bring up the slides. Firstly, uh, obviously, thanks to John, Claire and Peter for really tremendously thoughtful and stimulating presentations. Um, just to say that Monash University Publishing uh, supports these seminars by donating gifts. Uh, so each of you will have, normally uh, it's, I have the pleasure of handing them out at the seminar, but they're in the post. So hopefully sometime in the next few days, you'll each receive a book from Monash University Publishing. So thanks very much, MUP, for that. And be able to just move the slide. Also, just to remind colleagues that the Making Public History seminars continue as webinars for the remainder of this year. And the two events that already lined up on the 11th of August, uh, it's uh, the centenary, or sorry, the 50th anniversary. In fact, I've completely lost track, 70th, must be the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we have a panel talking about remembering the atomic bombs, history, memory, and politics in Australia and, and the Pacific. And then on the 10th of November, because this is, this is the United Nations year for botanical biodiversity, and we've got a seminar on Victoria's native vegetation, history, heritage, and politics. And you can book and those events through uh, the History Council website. And let me now just stop sharing in terms of concluding. Look, I'd like to thank uh, my co-hosts, Margaret Bertley, Alicia Chiretto, and Susie Prochke, Margaret, do unmute yourself so we can see you and thank you properly. I'd like to again thank our three panellists, Peter McPhee, John Patton, and Alicia Toretto. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming along. There's been 200 plus participants to this, our first Making Public History webinar. Uh, wherever you are, keep safe and have a lovely evening. So thank you all and good night. And Panelists are going to stick around just to have a brief debrief, but thanks very much. And uh, the, I can now formally close this session. Thank you. Thank you.